soldier. Who is he? Who is capable of defeating the secret Black Star Army. A soldier who has become a master ninja. Your destiny, my son, awaits you. The deadliest art of the Orient is now in the hands of an American. American Ninja. Starts Friday, September 20th. Consult your local listing. I've made so many friends from this place. The music is really good and the people are so friendly. The music's wicked. Why do I come to changes? This place where I can hear all my favorite music. And you always meet like better looking guys every time. I'd like to invite you to Ivor's Indian Salmon House for a taste of Northwest history. We built the salmon house exactly like an Indian longhouse. And we smoked fresh salmon over glowing alder coals, just like the Indians did. It's delicious, a complete seafood meal that you'll never forget. Right, Chief? Mmm, just like my mother used to make. And mine, too. Hi, I'm Brendan Lisa Tesh Tang. Hi, I'm Sunny Asu. Hi, I'm Laura Schneider. And when I'm not broadcasting the best video hits from the 80s and 90s, I'm the executive director at the Reach Gallery Museum. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hi. Oh, my God. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Hi, Ready everybody. Player Shoe TV. <laughs> Looking forward to this. This is a good experience. We're live and streaming. So excited to be here for this virtual book launch for a virtual book. Yeah, for our catalog for the exhibition, our exhibition Ready Player Two, yes. which if you can believe it, it started touring in 2017. 2017, yes. And like most things ended touring in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> that was really the end of, that was the, the final match of the dumpster fire, really. And yeah. And it sparked it off as the Ready Player Two was being done in 2020. Mm -hmm. I was just like, fuck it, we're burning it all down. <laughs> <laughs> It was a good run. It was a good it run. It was a good run. It was, it was a run. Let's be honest. We were in our final venue at the Illingworth Court Gallery in mm -hmm. uh, in Calgary, and in January we opened, and mm -hmm. it was open until March. So, really, yeah. it's, uh, you can't blame us. You yeah, can't no, blame no, players. you can't. No. We didn't realize turning the lights off when we left uh, would cause this. <laughs> I know. I know. I think the thing is that you shouldn't have sent me out there for the closing. That's <laughs> I. I may have been the catalyst for bringing shit across the country at the time. So. Mm -hmm. Highly likely. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. I tried to sneeze in here and wipe my nose with a <laughs> tissue, but it just, it's my fault. So we're good. tonight we're going to be meeting uh, with uh, one other uh, of the curators that was part of the show, and mm -hmm. uh, then she'll probably show you a little bit of what we've got in the book and all the, some of the treats that uh, await you if you do get the catalog. Um, but yeah, we wanted to take this time to kind of reflect on the show and how it all came together. And I think one of the sort of the questions that I get a lot is like, how did this how did this whole thing start rolling? Mm -hmm. And it really kind of started with you, Laura, and Sunny, didn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess that's where it started. Um, I think this discussion started, uh, when was it? I met you in PEI. That was like 2014, maybe? Yeah. So I don't it, was, it was a while back. It was a while back. I was still living in Montreal, and I was invited out to PEI to do a thing, and you were there. And, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we just you know, we bonded instantly. We became pretty close friends. Um, I helped you move a house like an actual house. Oh, um, in PEI on the East Coast? Oh, yeah, you throw it in the back of an F-150 and you get shit done, man. That's what happens. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, I, yeah, we met and we started talking about the possibility of working together. And then you happened to move to BC and you moved to uh, be the executive director at the Reach uh, Gallery Museum, which was amazing. And uh, I, th I believe I was the first call you made when you moved to BC. I Well, I actually moved here for you and to... That's to you know it's true, Sunny. You know it's true. There's a, a lot of people moved around the country for Sunny alone. Yeah, or away from Sunny, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> because of Sunny, yeah, exactly. Uh, so we, uh, Sunny and I met, what was it, back in 2009 at the BC yeah. Scenes, and it yeah. was in Ottawa. And uh, Ottawa, in Ottawa, they were doing this sort of feature on uh, BC arts and culture. And Sunny, you were having... The show, the first opening of um, Beat Nation was happening. Yeah. And, which is kind of amazing. And then there was also the show that we were in, Rhymes with Orange. Uh, blue, yeah. Blue like an orange? Blue like an orange? Something blue like, like an that. orange. It was blue like an orange. Yeah. So that was the, the one of the first iterations of uh, Beat Nation through the Grunt Gallery mm -hmm. and the Saw Gallery. Um, so we were out there for the, the BC scene, which was a really amazing experience because you got to see artists and art professionals from all over British Columbia doing their thing and, uh, you know, sharing this uh, national stage, whether, you know, whether it was arts or dance or theater, it was all there. And uh, that that's how we met. Um, yeah. And we kind of just hit it off right away. Like it was just uh, a really fun, uh, really fun night. Uh, we just kept on drinking beer after beer. You went double down on the beers and I ended up giving you a nickname. Yes. Two beers. Two, two beers. beers. And two yeah. beers thing. That right. was that was the initial seed of our bromance. Yes, would, exactly. Uh, grow <laughs> into <laughs> grow and blossom, uh, as they say. <laughs> bloom. Um, and then we got an opportunity to do uh, an or an official art collabo yeah. when you invited me to be part of your show at the Vancouver Art Gallery. That's right. Well, you know, we actually did uh, start talking about the collaboration uh, th that summer of 2009. Actually, I remember it because uh, there was something else big going on in Vancouver at the time. Like, I feel like the art scene in Vancouver was really kind of um, gelling together. There's just lots of really cool stuff. And uh, we were just hanging out on my patio on the balcony. Uh, there was you and Steve Tong and uh, Dana Warren. And, you know, we're just having a couple and uh, have a couple beers and just having some good times. And we started talking about collaboration. Let's collaborate, man. I love you. Let's collaborate. <laughs> I love you, I man. I love you, man. Let's make art together forever. Yeah. And then, and then I think it was you. You were just trying to angle in on some ghost action on my potter's wheel. I know that's well, what kind of. I, you know, I didn't want to make you feel like an object, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we now, okay, so Laura approached you about doing a show at the art gallery. And mm -hmm. then I was like brought in into that mix because I think it was kind of an opportunity. We were having some conversations after the show that we did to, uh, or that I did a small bit at um, the Vancouver Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. And then Laura and you were chatting. Yeah, no, exactly. So yeah, we, we talked about uh, our first official collaboration was for, uh, we come to, uh, um, what the hell was the name of that show again? I can't remember now. <laughs> uh, we Come to Witness. We Come to Witness. Yes, it's on my door yeah. as a poster. Um, I've just done so many shows, I forget the names of them. Oh, well, you know. I know, is... right? Uh, so, yeah, we asked you to uh, kind of, Laura's. This is, this is, Laura is her face right now is what, is what you get when all three of us are together in a room or a virtual room. Uh, but, yeah, so we worked on that collaboration and then we started talking about how we can further collaborate. Uh, Laura and I were discussing uh, doing a solo show and I thought it might have been a really good opportunity to roll with a couple ideas I had for this basement thing and then I brought you into the conversation and it just kind of um, ballooned and snowballed from there which was um, really fun and it was just amazing to see how this show has grown and how it grew legs uh, mm -hmm. as we kind of been rolling around. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it was kind of amazing. I think from that show, I think we were looking at Emily Carr's little collectible card mm -hmm. holders and pins and whatnot that she was making and citing of indigenous cultures and using her pseudonym, Clee Wick. And we were thinking about collectibles and that idea of when people collect our artwork as well, and then very much thinking about blind box collectibles uh, that's part of geek culture and uh, like with the later Star Trek things or Doctor Who or whatever. And that was kind of, I feel like that really kind of got the ball rolling for what we did with Ready Player Two, for sure. No, for sure. And I think it's interesting to think about it because, you know, I think there's always this assumption that when artists get together and talk about a potential collaboration, like it's a super serious thing that happens but you know i think with us because we're just two giant nerds and we're involved in so many aspects of pop culture whether it is i think we're both collectors of various things we're both gamers in different ways um we both you know love movies and pop culture and television and comic books and it just became a, a launching pad for us to talk about um, how those things have influenced uh, our lives and our professional practices um, and how we can kind of explore it further um, by kind of um, really settling down and embracing um, that pop culture, um, that kitsch. And um, yeah, it was just, uh, yeah. Laura, like when you came into like, well, you were, you were at the, the, with the beginning of the project from its inception, like, as sort of watching it sort of blossom and grow and, and kind of go into a whole bunch of different directions. Like, how did you, cause you were like our third collaborator in a lot of ways. Uh, well, I'll use this phrase. I've used it before in artist talks and, and certainly several times with you guys. Um, I think of myself as being the extra in the buddy comedy that is the Sonny and Brendan show. Um, and I think <laughs> in terms of the, how the exhibition evolved, um, I think that, Although it obviously, you know, I'm I'm being I'm making jokes. Um, there's something that is inherently uh, improvisational, um, if not cinematic. I don't think this is a I, oh, that's a word I would use to describe this show. There's something about it that resembles theater, both in terms of its almost set design, creating immer immersive environments for for our audience, but um, in terms of how it it came together. On one hand, I think it was rooted in some really interesting um, critical ideas. Um, thinking about the homogenizing um, aspects of, of mass culture in the 80s and 90s when we were all sort of in our preteens and teen years. Um, th so there was these aspects of it, uh, particularly from a, a race-based angle, which I think both of you um, explore really inter in interesting ways in this show. Um, but it was also really freeform. Everything that uh, that we we did in terms of that first install felt really improvisational, and um, it it was uh, unlike any exhibition I've been involved with. Certainly, I think one of the more fun exhibitions I've ever been a part of, um, and it's largely because of that. I think that just I mean, you guys are are you know I think our our viewers tonight. Uh, understand that you're constantly riffing off each other. And um, it made for a, a really unique um, generative experience. I think, um, you know, it changed, the exhibition changed every time and it, that started, that started here. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Speaking of which, we actually do have a question that's coming up in the chat that we're pretty excited about how active that is. And here, let me read this first one. It says, Hi, I'm a Nigerian prince who has just deposited 75 kajillion dollars in a time-sensitive bank account. Oh, that's very generous. Uh, please, yeah, uh, please forward me your bank account details ASAP. P.S. Mm -hmm. How does Ready Player Two address racial stereotypes and identity? Thanks, mm -hmm. Nigerian prince, uh, wow. for that question. Um, Sonny, do you want to take that one? You want to? Yeah, I think. Uh... <clears throat> How does it address racial stereotypes and uh, identity? So I was just rethinking the question, you know, we're, we'll make sure it's really stuck in my head. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for, from our perspective, it was a way to look at how, um, yeah, we've just kind of been enveloped by this kind of racial identity, um, whether it is, um, you know, my indigenous identity, but also as a white passing person and your, um, you know, whatever it is that you happen to be. Um, 
Jesus, sonny. Come on. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to say something stupid for once. Um, that really means I'm not prepared for the question. I'm just not. <laughs> I'm just, I just can't do it. I just can't. Do it. Well, I think like it's like there's some really fun things like, you know, I think reflecting on this show, like there was like the scalp hunter that you had like that comic book. And then there was, um, I had like these little tchotchkes like that, uh, like of the Orient. Mm -hmm. And I've like now deemed them my trauma treasures. Right. And then I had the, uh, G we had the GI Joes that were the ones of color. So the GI POCs. And I think it was like, kind of like this sort of playing and dismantling. Like when I was growing up, man, we, there was there was no representation of like brown bodies in popular mm -hmm. culture at all. Yeah. And I think the show started definitely becoming like a meditation for me on those kinds of, those lightning rod moments. Like there mm -hmm. is, there is uh, with the, the arcade cabinets that we did, there was uh, the Dalsim character that I reinterpreted it as a self portrait and yeah. kind of playing those things up. I think, yeah, like I, and even those ads, and I, we've included some of the ads in, in this show, but uh, in this presentation, but those ones kind of really exploring those sort of microaggressions that people of color got a lot and, you know, still too to this day through mm -hmm. advertising and mass media. No, for uh, sure. And it's interesting to think about too, because, you know, when you talk about that, you know, like I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm a white passing individual. And so, when I was growing up in that era, you know, when I saw the American Ninja, I, I saw myself in that person because mm -hmm. you know, he's a white person and I pass as a white person. Uh, so it's interesting to kind of dissect the culture um, post-mortem post post in a way by looking at it through those trauma treasures and even looking at how some of those kind of trinkets in that tragedy and, you know, what those you know what you understand is these kind of trauma treasures actually i look at the ones that i could see from a native american or indigenous standpoint and i can kind of see in you know earlier versions of myself and my own exploration of my identity how i even moved and gravitated towards some of those things and and thought about how those images sh are are, are what I should be looking at, be mm -hmm. looking like, like, should I be, you know, should I embrace this native identity of this? Should I embrace that stereotype or should I go against it? Um, and I think as I've been able to grow as an artist and even through this show, understanding that I am, I am going against that racial, that racial stereotype, but looking at it as a way to deconstruct it and have conversations around it about how it can be traumatizing to people when they see these things and how these trauma trauma objects become collectibles in a way for us to remember what the past was like mm -hmm. but even having in that focal point in your mind of understanding that that's how the past was but the past is it's it's still like that now like we still have these assumptions of what identity should be depending on what your identity is um, and it's interesting to look at those objects and, and deconstruct it from that angle um yeah yeah um do you want to do you want to read the other the uh, another question from oh, chat did we get another one coming in yeah we did get another one Let's see here. Oh, chat. Here we go. What does this say over here? I'm looking at the thing. Uh, oh, hello, sexy. Smiley wink. I am a hot and single females living in your arena. I could transfer naked photos of my supple undercarriage. But first, may I ask you how Brendan's hair factors into your arts, Mr. Sunny? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. And how nostalgia is explored and discussed within this show. Wow. But uh, do, uh, do you want to get the hair question first, or? Well, hey, it's it's it's. I think it's a very important question, and uh, you know, um, your hair is amazing, and it has. I think if you take a look, even I was going through like a digital cleanup of all my stuff, uh, of all my digital photos over the past couple decades and I was coming through you know 2017 and going up through our show and to seeing how your hair has changed uh from our first opening in the reach to our closing in Calgary has been uh quite amazing so I think it definitely has a very strong weight to it and mm -hmm. uh I am Body, yeah. I, I am just attracted to it I am like a moon around your Jupiter sir 
this is true. This is what we're talking about here. This yeah. is what you're, you're, you're tuning into. Laura's like shaking her head. <laughs> um, well, so she's along, the, you know, she's along for the ride. And I think, you I know, know, earlier said you, you're the, you're the extra in the body cup, uh, the body cup, <laughs> the buddy cup. <laughs> That's I maybe guess. another question from chat. <laughs> right. um, no, but no, look, I think it's you know, I think it's you know, she's she's nodding along, but it, it's 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 very apt because you're not just an extra in the buddy cup movie. You are uh the Joe Pesci character to our Riggs and Murtaugh. Hmm. Interesting. I am that's a know. deep dive. You, I want someone in the chat to tell me which lethal weapon that was. <laughs> <laughs> so it, Nostalgia. <laughs> Gotta get back to the, like the nostalgia question. Yeah, <laughs> nostalgia. Yeah, so I, I think there is that's one thing that like is disgusting. The show. Yeah, I think it is something that we definitely do play with a lot in the show. And it's there is one thing. I think there was always a danger that like because we were citing popular culture so much that we were a little afraid that there might be like kind of entering into that sort of celebrational space kind of like more like fan art where we're looking at these things and, and celebrate things but i think you know like we wanted to create an atmosphere to trigger memories so like creating the bowl of cheesies uh mm -hmm. which is the answer what was the name of that one the answer to everything life the universe and everything like, thank you you <laughs> so uh and that is a or uh, have curators involved exactly that is our our one of the, actually the sort of the few full on collaborative pieces that we did, like where yeah. we were riffing on ideas. And, mm -hmm. and so it's a bowl of 42 Hawkins cheesies, Hawkins porcelain cheesies, yeah. and then in a copper lined maple bowl. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to kind of trigger those memories of childhood and, and again, revisiting those spaces as those formative spaces for us mm -hmm. and thinking about how they inform our identity and also in a lot of ways kind of stir up a lot of emotions for other people. And we had like cassette tapes and yeah. all sorts of things throughout the show. Posters and all that fun stuff. And it was just like, you know, a lot of uh, stuff that was present uh, specifically anyways, in my childhood, like I would go through and I, you know, I just had a good time going through a lot of the thrift shops and uh, refinding um, some of the stuff like the, uh, mm -hmm. we happened to find, I think it was in the Yukon that, that was it in the Yukon that I found those um, time life, um, uh, oh, the, the, the mysteries of the universe. Yeah, 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 the yeah, paranormal yeah. books. Yeah, I think it was in the Yukon that I found those. And it was amazing to find those because it really just sparked a memory of um, – uh, of me wanting those books when I was a kid and remembering watching um, the infomercials and begging my mom when she came home from work, you know, I gotta, I gotta pay four ninety five dollars uh, over 12 months to buy these books because I need these books in my life. <laughs> um, it was just, you know, it was fun to go through this stuff, but then you, you arrange it in such a way that um, it's not just this setup of nostalgia and kitsch it's also mm -hmm. set up in such a way that you know we're inviting people to come in and think about the spaces that we inhabit and the spaces that we found um solace in as as youth you know mm -hmm. we spend time in these basements and we you know for me i'd be hanging out with my cousins and playing video games and reading comic books and um you know playing with our toys and joe and all that kind of stuff and you know and for you it was you know about gaming and and finding that 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 solace and identity through this practice mm -hmm. of, of of gaming and pop culture and i think it's always a, a worry about trying to bring these two things together um without having it be kitschy and not having it be kind of like a one-off and i think mm -hmm. Um, you know, as I think about this show now that, you know, it could have been that one-off situation, um, but it, it, it grew legs and it turned around and it changed at every iteration. And it was just a really wonderful experience to see. Mm -hmm. um, and I even, oh, yeah, cool. it's really important that we, uh, for the, the viewers this evening that might not have had a chance to see the exhibition, to just um, kind of describe the strategies that we used in terms of creating a variety mm -hmm. of Places that would have been uh, would have recalled the the places mm -hmm. in your youth. So uh, maybe I'll just um, let you guys describe what it would what what visiting the exhibition was like. What is the path that our visitor took through the show? Yeah. So uh, Laura was really gracious enough to kind of go kind of hog wild with how we split up the space. The Reach Gallery is a massive gallery, and um, so in the space that we had, we broke it up into three sort of discrete 
areas. And the first space was a very much like a dom the domestic space. So it included the kitchen and the quintessential basement uh, with all fake wood paneling and all its uh, beauty. Um, and then we then we moved into the second space, which is kind of the first space where I, as a youth and Sunny as well, kind of started testing out our own uh, identities. And we were we weren't under the purview of our parents' roof and weren't sort of going by their rules, so to speak. And that was the arcade. And so and then so we spent time in the arcade. And then moving into the third space uh, is the comic book store which is kind of a really interesting space. Uh, I would say that the arcade is probably the most abstract one. And then the comic book store actually had more relationship to our lives as, as visual artists, mm -hmm. contemporary visual artists now. And I think, Laura, I think when we were talking about it, you had said this is, that, the, that the comic book store is most analogous to the gallery setting mm -hmm. and, and what that space looks like. Mm -hmm. Both in terms of, of what it looks like, but also in terms of um, the consumer activity uh, and the sort of fetishization of the object that takes place in those spaces. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I, I think was really interesting about how people move through those spaces is that they were um, mimetic, I think more mimetic at the start. So the domestic spaces really did resemble, I think, Sunny, one of your friends, when they came to the uh, the opening at the Reach, made a comment about how it looked just like your basement. Um, yeah, we'd hang out in this place. And he was triggered. He was just like, this looks exactly like the basement we hung out in. Right. <laughs> Um, but, but then moving through those spaces, they become more, um, if, I don't know if, if they become more abstract so much as they start to resemble more and more the gallery space itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. Also, I, there's spaces in which your relationship as young people, I think, uh, young people and capital changed, um, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, the, the relationship between independence, um, and consumer power. So, you know, like being in a basement, you're really under mom and dad's roof. Um, you know, and and you're their responsibility using their money. They're paying the bills, yeah. buying the groceries. Um, by the time you're visiting vis visiting an arcade, you know you have a bit of pocket money perhaps to throw around. And by the time you're buying collectibles, you're really exercising your identity through your purchases. Mm -hmm. so I think there's a really interesting um, element uh, that relates consumer habits to identity, and and where race comes into that conversation is really mm -hmm. interesting as well. Yeah, you forgot to mention the the one space. But you forgot to mention the kitchen. Oh yeah, yeah, the kitchen at the beginning. Yeah, of the yeah. gallery where yeah, where we'd set up a, a nice D and D and D and D thing. And that was interesting too because that that became I found that space to be more of an introspective space. Um, mm -hmm. Just I mean, even just in the way that it was set up, it was like you know set up with a single bowl of uh, you know a, a, you know a bowl of cereal waiting to be poured, um, and there was a map for the you know the the specific galleries that we were in that you had taken time to draw. Um, but yeah, I kind of, it is interesting to kind of see that introspection where it was almost seems like the kitchen space was more of like that solitary space. And then you move into more of a communal space, which is the, um, the basement scene. And then you move into, uh, you know, a, a broader um, interactive space like the arcade. And then you move into that again, more of an introspective space within the gallery um, where you're able to kind of take in, you know, those objects um, at different times. We should actually, because we're launching the book, we should probably talk about the book that we're launching. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so, you know, um, supply chains being what they are uh, right now, uh, we're so grateful that we got our hands on a copy of the book. Uh, and actually, I think I got it. Yes, I got it. FedEx to me. Um, so here we go. Here is the book. Um, there we go. Can we receipt? There we go. There, isn't that amazing? Uh, uh, like here, I'm just gonna flip through it for everybody. Oh, uh, there's some pages of uh, it's incredible. It's it's book. It's really um, oh, there's some that book. Oh, there, yeah, there's some cutouts. Okay, there, yeah, there's some cutouts that you can cut out for the book. It's really. I know it's it's so heavy. I can I. I'm having a hard time holding it with one hand. Um, but you know, like there's a lot of amazing writers that have contributed to this uh, this book as well. but um, okay, this is this is not working. This is not working. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, that wasn't the real book. We don't have the real book, Sonny. and well, and actually, I'm a little disappointed because 
I've got a little information that would shock our audience right now. Oh, this and, is new. Uh, this wasn't Laura? Yeah, no, this is off script. I got a fax. You can see it says fax right there. Um, right. From the Reach Gallery, Laura. Oh, and, uh, oh you told is, me about this. Is this the... Yeah, yeah this is the minute from the meeting where here, I'll read Laura. the meeting. And it's just uh, the LS. I think we should move forward with the book launch. K, but is the book printed? LS, no, but I think we could take advantage of accidental Google hits from Cly uh, Klein's new book, Ready Player Two, the same title. Uh, so they tabled the motion allegedly to launch the book in December. And there was one four and eight again. Against. Eight against. And there was an update. The motion still passed. Brendan, yeah, the motion still passed. So Brendan, I don't know. You're not supposed to. I'm be not going to say. It's, it. it's <sighs> this, is, this is what I get. This is, I'm sorry, Laura. This, this is, is getting, I think, you need to. Okay, this is getting way too heated. Can we just uh, take a quick commercial break here and uh, come back to see the results of the paternity test? <laughs> Who is Jack Burton? How are you going to spring us? I have no idea. Big trouble in Little China. Ready PG-13. Make it tonight, make it tonight, make it tonight. Mm, yeah. Make it tonight, make it tonight, make it tonight. Make it tonight, make it tonight, make it tonight. Make it tonight, make it tonight, make it tonight. Make it tonight. Uncle Ben's Rice. So many wild and wonderful ways of making it. Make it tonight, make it tonight, make it tonight. The Western Way. It gives you more kinds of Pacific Northwest. From the getaway kind to the one that got away kind. From the kind you look up to to the kind you look down from. Western Airlines gives you more. Four nonstops to Portland every day. Five to Seattle, Tacoma, and two daily nonstops to Vancouver. Giving you more to the Pacific Northwest. That's the Western way. Well, I'm glad that uh, diffused the situation. Laura, Brendan, are you guys okay? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, we're okay. good. Yeah. Okay, right I think now. we can go on. All right, so uh, the amazing book, we did talk about uh, the writers that are involved. Laura, you've got those lined up, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, no, we're really excited about launching the book when it's finally printed. Uh, it's and, coming, folks, don't worry about it. You'll be able yeah, to get this delightful book. It's coming. It's, we, it's we're coming. Uh, It's the we're color of cheesies. We're launching the book tonight. Uh, we're also using this as an occasion to wrap the exhibition, um, which as we mentioned, uh, has toured to five venues, um, not including the Reach. So it uh, opened in the Reach in 2017, and then it toured to the Yukon Arts Center and Touchstones Nelson, and the Niagara Artists Center in St. Catharines, Ontario. Um, and then it was at the AGYU in Toronto, and finally wrapped up at Illingworth Kerr this past spring. Um, so it certainly made the rounds. Uh, we're really excited and uh, to have shared it with so many people across the country and really um, feeling grateful to all of the organizations and curators that supported the show across its tour. And we're also really excited that most of them, no, sorry, all of them contributed to the book. So um, we're lucky to have had Mary Bradshaw from the Yukon Arts Center uh, write a short piece about the Basement, Erin Fay from Touchstones has shared her thoughts on the kitchen. Um, the uh, Troy Patanad, who's from uh, the AU Arts, the university in Alberta that um, is home to Illingworth Tour Gallery, he has written about the comic book store and Emily Changer from um, AGYU now at Agnes Etherington in Queens has written about the comic book store. So we've got a huge lineup of really talented curators slash writers who've contributed. In addition to two commissioned writers, we have Amy Fung, who's written a fantastic um, creative response to the exhibition. And also Elizabeth Laponce, who is a really well-known scholar and indigenous game, uh, game designer. Um, and she's written about her own childhood experiences with gaming. So it's packed with great writing. Um, it's 148 pages, full color and hard copy. 
um, should be available in February. We're going to be doing pre-orders at the Reaches website. So we do encourage people, if you're interested, get in touch with us soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is the color of cheesies. Like it's it is color. also the color of cheesies. <laughs> We're not, not joking. Yeah, it's the Pantone with an, es an established Pantone color for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it was, it's really amazing to, you know, I think as artists, um, you know, to have a show, um, you know, be so fun and just like, just, you know, two dudes, you know, riff off each other, like the bromance going on. Um, our wives both talk about the bromance. It's, it's hilarious and also sweet. Um, but just to see how the show um, grew and got legs um, and like I said, grew through every venue. Like there was always something I feel was uh, not changed, but just added depending on where we were um, in, in the country. And, hey, Sonny, we, we actually have a question about that in the chat again. Oh. Yeah, here, I'll just read that one. Okay. And it is, uh, Dear Star Kitty 42, oh. I see you are ranked very low on Google. For a small fee, I can boost your presence and help you source materials. Hmm, that's oh. good to know. Okay, thank you. Um, and it says, on that note, how did other galleries find some of the elements used for the installation of Ready Player Two? Hmm. Um, so yeah, this was kind of one of those logistical issues. We never thought that we would tour this show. No. And it was actually a genius move on Laura's part to think up of the um, of having other galleries that would be interested in the show to find those elements. And yeah, so when we staged the show here at the Reach, it really was kind of a staging. We borrowed furniture from places. We borrowed, I think, our couch from Habitat from for Humanity and a rug. No, um, I bought that couch. Oh, you brought the couch. <laughs> I, brought, I bought the couch from. <laughs> The Habitat of Humanity here in Campbell River. And my oldest daughter loved it so much she wanted it back, but it ended up disintegrating on site. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it smelled pretty bad. But um, it was the, the coffee table was borrowed from Habitat and also that massive entertainment unit um, that the TV went in. Yeah. Um, of course, these are things that can be sourced in every community. And when we were contacted by the lovely Mary Bradshaw at the Yukon Arts Center, the night of the opening and she said, I'm really interested about the show. I've heard about it. I would like to know how, whether it's planned to tour, which of course got us thinking. Um, it also, you know, created this challenge for us, which is, um, you know, a fine art shipper moving a dis disintegrating couch and a really heavy, um, you know, oak um, entertainment unit just didn't seem like a good use of, of any gallery's funds. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, that challenge presented was really an opportunity for each community to make the show their own. And I think our curators across the country certainly took up the challenge in some really interesting ways that I'm gonna let you guys talk about because you you saw the show um, mm -hmm. in every iteration. Um, but it was a really, I think, unique way of exploring again, this theme of what was homogenous in the 1980s and 90s. What was mm -hmm. the sort of look and feel of everyone's house? And I think, you know, the kitchen wallpaper in that installation at every gallery for all of us was like, oh yeah, we remember that wallpaper. Yeah. We remember the dusty rose. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and so it's it, there was that homogenization that was happening through mass culture at the time because really the selection of consumer goods at the time was so different than it is now. Um, but at the same time, regionally, you know, there were there were certainly differences. And I think the Yukon was was a great example of that. But I'm gonna let you guys tell that story of the uh, the wood paneling. Yeah, like I think, I know, because so kind of coming back to the catalog, that's the kind of interesting thing about the catalog is that even though the show toured, each one of the chapters has a slightly different iteration of the show mm -hmm. and a slightly different look of the show. And the fake wood paneling that we had from at the at the Yukon Art Center was one hundred percent legit fake mm -hmm. wood paneling that had been pulled from somebody's uh, reno and used for our show, which was kind of amazing. But who, what was really funny is also, I, I remember you telling me this story, Laura, that Mary, you had talked about how we were had the quintessential basement suite. And she's like, well, we're up in the Yukon. We don't have basements. <laughs> <laughs> Permafrost doesn't allow for basements. 
Yeah, but there still was like that that ability to sort of even sort of connect to that audience. Like I remember the night that we were there, the opening night, the director of the Yukon Art Center came in to the, the basement suite and I had this ongoing role of ads and, and CBC sign-offs. And there was the sign-off for CBC where there was a young person singing O Canada and the, it stopped the director in, his, in their tracks and they just, they were like, I went to school with that person. I haven't thought about them in decades. And it was just like, it's such a great, it's so, it's so much fun to have a show that is triggering Gen Xers. Like, mm -hmm. you know, speaking to like, to our generation quite heavily and sort of, because we were talking about things that we are thinking about and that's kind of like where we are at in our lives as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so that nostalgia, it's not, it wasn't like just a ruse and a strategy for us. I think, you know, in this case, people were recognizing, you know, folks yeah. the clips that uh, that Brendan put together. So yeah. again, I, it, there's this constant tension between what is mimetic and what is, um, and, and just that sort of conjured sense of nostalgia and what is, is really real and feels authentic to those of us who grew up at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And it was interesting to see like how all the different source material changed uh, through every iteration. Like, it almost feels like, what was it? Was it Toronto or was it Calgary that feel, felt like they were really blinging things up? Like, there was a ton of money in one of those one of those spots, and like like their thrift store stuff was just like immaculate. Yeah, it was it was worth curve. I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they would pull up. Oh, how does this stuff look? And it's like postmodern like yeah, mid-century modern real yeah. yeah yeah exactly like i yeah get that stuff so i can keep it please <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was all danish teak and i'm just like no 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 no. my immigrant parents were not interested in danish teak they, it was all flower patterns all the time <laughs> yeah. you know it was and then like really crazy area rugs and all of yeah. that sort of stuff it's just like yeah. that's that's one of the funny things about the show and kind of the aesthetic that we wanted to even come up with this this artist talk or this book launch is kind of it was just like nope that's too nice we gotta yeah. get more fake wood paneling ugly ugly. <laughs> ugly ugly pile up the ugly yeah, 11 11 ugly please yeah, yeah. but there was uh there was yeah a lot of sort of great things that were that happened and you know again like expanding upon those things and and adding to them as we as we went through and it was really interesting like to kind of have that sort of ubiquity that kind of floated throughout all the different shows and, mm -hmm. and how they, and who gravitated towards them. Like I felt like the arcade and in the catalog, you see the arcade at uh, AGYU was gorgeous because oh, yes. um, yeah. you, Sunny, that was the first time that we actually got to do the large sort of mural on the, on yeah. the back wall. That was yeah. really something else. And it totally reminded me of like the family fun center in Nanaimo. With, yeah. Uh, the electronic stuff so, yeah it was really yeah. fantastic yeah we had a family fun center here in camp river like the uh the arcade that i used to go to like and that's really what i wanted to capture and i think actually uh in in saint catherine's the arcade i think was captured the most perfectly because it was such a it was a darker um, gallery and we were able, really able to play up with lighting in that show. And I think even now that I think about it and think about how lighting comes into effect, uh, I think Laura, you mentioned this earlier, how um, the show was theatrical. And I think um, that really spoke to, um, you know, both Brendan and I's past of being involved in theater when we were, um, you know, in our in kids and, and teenagers and stuff. So I really, um, it, it just became a really, interesting and fun show to stage because we were able to kind of flex those old creative muscles that we used to flex when we were kids and we were just exploring a whole bunch of different um, cultural activities whether it be art or acting or theater or whatever it might have been it was just um it's just a really uh great show to do um but there was interesting things that, that happened along the way um like in the yukon like uh that's just a weird place like the stuff that happens there like the frozen toe, like, like I don't know if anyone on on the chat has heard about this frozen toe in the Yukon, but there's a bar that has a frozen toe. It's been like detached from a person forever, <laughs> um, and you could you could drink a shot of something with this toe in it, and if it touches your lips, you're like a true Yukon or something. Laura's getting a bit nauseous, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and and on the news when we happened to be up there, someone had actually swallowed the toe on purpose. Yeah. 
Yeah. But there was like, there was always lots of interesting things about that journey, but there was a particularly weird event that was a little unsettling. It was uh, nice. that happened to us in the Yukon yeah, while we were true. in Whitehorse. Yeah. And um, maybe, maybe we could roll it now, Johnny. Brendan Tang. Hey. Hey, everybody. <laughs> He's making me open yes. the ceiling. Yes. I am going to give you Me. This. Yeah. Me. You do get this. I don't need a hanger. You know. Who needs a hanger? <laughs> Sunny AC doesn't need a hanger. There you go. Phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Should, should we roll through the whole adventure? Like, should we should we take people on a narrative adventure? Uh, okay. I guess yeah, we could, I, I could so. show them where yeah. everything is. So it's under this lampshade. So there's the lampshade for look, look behind, behind the boats. The boats. Now the boats are there. So, yeah. <clears throat> and now these boats are in every room. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so we just look behind the boats. And behind the boats. There we go. Yes. Look at the other painting. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay, well, we'll put that well, up we later. Leave we'll that. Put that up later. <laughs> Just we, did, we did lots of hanging yesterday, so I feel comfortable just leaving these on the ground. Yes. This is and awesome. I want to point out this giant stain on here. It's not foreboding at all. Not foreboding at all. It looks like it could be a blood stain. <laughs> blood stain. Could be just a coffee stain. Look oh. above the sprinkler. Now, you know, it's just like, oh, that seems like a fun adventure. But then yeah. I'm just like, look at eyebrows. those eyebrows. You got the eyebrows. The eyebrows are like a little scary. So that's why I was just like, I'm just going to... Bring in a grown ass man to do this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so now behind the sprinkler, so you figure it's this one. Yeah. And I don't know. Like I'm also there is also that sprinkler. Yeah. But this one look kind of looks like it might have been. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's do this. Uh, da -da -da. Oh, is what? that just a beer cap? Is that what this is? Ah, oh, there's beer. It's a beer. <laughs> Can I reach it? Here, I can reach it. Oh, don't. There you go. It's a beer. It's a beer. It's a beer. <laughs> July 10, 2017. There we go. And then it says found July, uh, found September 21st, 2017. So this is the second adventure. Wow. This is the second adventure. So really. Now. I wonder, did is this a beer we leave there now, and we just write found the date? <laughs> we could. Or we do could, we drink the beer? I think we could go to the liquor store and probably buy some more beer for this. Yeah. All right. <laughs> there should you we, go. Should we amend it to go on a, like a further adventure throughout the entire hotel? Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. There we go. There you go. There. Mystery solved. Mystery solved. Thanks, honey. There was no tow. There was no tow. No. Sorry, sorry. Dawson City. Sorry, Dawson City. Some crazy times up there. Uh, Keeping it weird in Whitehorse. Keeping it weird in the Yukon. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a really interesting adventure to go through that. It was just fun. I think you were chilling out in your room, and I was chilling out in my room, and you just sent me this panicky yeah. text. I, you, and yeah. And I, I think it just more... It more points to my sort of unsureness about people. And I'm just like, I think there's a severed head up there, but I just don't want to look at it right What's now. What's in the box? So, um, but one thing that we should actually mention again, because I do <laughs> noticing people are asking about it, is where to get the book. Yeah. So, well, we, you can go to the reach.ca and uh, they will have uh, information up on their website about how to order the book when it's available. <laughs> order and now. Order now. Go to the. <laughs> HTTPS <laughs> colon backslash backslash. Yeah, Gee, step I'm not, one. I'm yeah. not going to be able to spell it. I'm going to mumble it all up. Yeah. Uh, but someone did ask a question on the chat uh, about uh, if um, they can get a signed copy. We could we could try and figure something out. We'll have a little conversation with Laura and see if we could figure something out. But uh, mm -hmm. we'll figure something out for you, person who wants a signed copy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But okay, without further ado, well, uh, welcome back to Ready Player Two TV. Uh, and I wanted to introduce uh, one of our other guests that we have tonight, and it's Aaron Fay from Touchstones in Nelson, British Columbia, exactly 502 Vernon Street, Nelson, BC. 
to be precise. I don't have a poster cold dose. So I'm sorry but, about uh, that. Yeah. Um, Aaron, so welcome, Aaron. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi. So Aaron is the curator uh, at the uh, Touchstones Gallery in Nelson. And I'm so glad that you can join us tonight. I, I am as well. I think you brought me on for the really serious content, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we're totally about here is serious content. Before we open up a lot of old wounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 deeply troubling for me, the memories of this exhibition and seeing you two, it's like really, I don't know. Okay. I think actually though that's one question that I was wondering about you uh, because I think the touchstones was what would you say, Sonny? Was the smallest venue that we we showed this? Uh, I think St. Catharines might have been a smidge smaller, but it was oh, that's definitely up there as one of the smallest. It was, it was we, a very interesting space. It's it's segmented in an interesting way, but we, we were able to make it fit. Uh, I know absolutely. Aaron, you were kind of worried about it for a minute. No. 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 You weren't no, especially when the nine crates showed up and filled up your entire space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was a definite learning curve, and having my entire family helping as preparatory staff uh, was also you know part of the fun. That was awesome though. That was awesome to have them involved. Yeah, I didn't. We have like speaking of like this whole theatrical nature of the show. Wasn't there somebody that you had on board who used to do like set design for like the Phantom of the Opera and stuff like that? He was a blood specialist in some theater in um, Alberta. And there was no blood in the show, which is too bad because it would have added just a whole other. And then we could have I really brought him on. I didn't know he was a blood specialist. Are you telling me we could have had some blood splattering during the entire exhibition? Yeah. Or during our artist talk, that would have been amazing. Like all of a sudden, like an alien popping out of your chest, honey. <laughs> that would have been. Well, yeah, the chest reveal. Wonderful. I didn't bring it up. It felt like that boat had sailed. <laughs> or you just didn't want us to know. No. <laughs> it's probably good that you didn't tell us because we would have been like relentless and trying to get something blowing up out of someone's body. That's yes. Yeah. That, I just can't that, try to keep my head down. And um, mm -hmm. but uh, and there was so much going on and having that happen in a week in a tiny space was um was I mean it was it was a highlight, definitely. I don't think it's ever going to be something that's going to match it. <laughs> that's really great to hear. Now, I, one question we had, like the each of the different galleries hall had all different sorts of programming that was in around this uh, around the show. There was some that had like DJ nights and then uh, other sort of events. And then there was one where they were screening uh, movies, like 80s movies in the basement uh, suite as well. But you guys did something also a little bit different, didn't you? Yes, I, uh, my son Eli and his buddies who have been raging a D&D &D campaign for seven years or some crazy piece of time. Uh, yeah, I had them come in and they had been touring their band on the coast and they were like deathly hung over and came into the Touchstones gallery space at like 10 o'clock at night and then we were there till about two and these they did not stop they were like i laid on the couch and just watched them and turned off all the lights except for the light in the kitchen that shone directly down on them and had a photographer come in and take pictures and then he wandered off and then i just like laid there and watched them and it just kind of activated the space and in a really bizarre and awesome way and and i thought that you guys would have loved it. And yeah. Yeah, it was all of the things. That that was uh, one of my favorite parts about that show is like uh, there was maps that I did for each one of the shows of their general layout in the same way that you would do like a Dungeons and Dragons map. And so I'm so excited that that space actually got to be used for a game of D&D, &D, uh, of some role playing. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fun. It's fun too when you mentioned that you just kind of hung out and laid on a couch. And I think um, people, as we toured the show and attended the openings and did our talks and stuff, it was always interesting to talk to people about can I, can I go sit? Can I, can I go sit on the chair? Yeah, go sit on the chair. Like we welcome people to go in there and sit on the couch, lay on the couch if you wanted to, pick up one of the magazines or the comic books. Um, you know, it was just a really, it was just really, fun to see that that kind of those spaces come to life um you know i think having a game night in that space really kind of high, highlighted um the liveliness of the show 
and, and kids reacted way better to the exhibition in the sense that they were willing to make that leap and see a gallery space configured in a completely different way. Whereas adults, especially like not to generalize, but some Albertan tourists who kind of like cruise through or just like, what is going on here? Like <laughs> they really, like we had so many comments that the reconciliation arcade game was broken. And it was like, <laughs> It is broken. <laughs> that's <laughs> kind of true on yeah. yeah, that's kind of true on many levels. <laughs> it's funny when I went to the reconciliation uh, arcade cabinet when we got to Nelson, um, there was a quarter in it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so I got I got twenty five cents for reconciliation, folks. <laughs> that was your first tip as an artist. <laughs> yeah, thanks, KT. I yeah. got my twenty five cents from reconciliation. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how real it was. Is yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So actually, Aaron, I remember when, like when we were chatting in in Nelson, I was just like, "So have you ever played D and D?" Uh, and you had said no. Have you have you got a chance to do it yet? No, I'm a little scared of it. I was kind of like I was a little freaked out with the guys I went to high school with who were in the basement and then never came out. And then when they did, they had like staffs with like fur on it and stuff. And so I was kind of, I was a bit freaked out by D&D, &D, to be honest. Full on LARPing. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah. Well, you well should, tonight's you should, your lucky you night. Check out Brendan's uh, staff with the hair on it. Yes, I have many staffs of varying hair lengths. And okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, this is taking a twist. Um, so I That's thought it was this be sound dirty. Like I, did, I was trying to go somewhere that wasn't, but it just it came out that way. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you guys could see Laura laughing her, her face off right now. It's yeah. So, yeah. She's, yeah. Turning <laughs> she's, off. she's off ending right the she's doing this to the director. I don't know what that <laughs> means, for Laura. Um, so actually I thought it would be this opportunity to roll up some characters for you. If you're I think do you have the dice there? Do you have your do you have a whole bunch of little dice? I have lots. lots of numbers? Sunny, you've got one too? Okay. So the first thing we're gonna figure out about is what type of character you are. And so I'm gonna get you to roll a D100, which are these these ones that uh, they're 10-sided die. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, so one of them has two double zeros on them and another one has just a single okay. zero yeah. on it. Yeah. Okay, so roll that once. Sunny, you can roll along with it. Okay. Okay, I got 27. Or no, sorry, 21, lied. 21? Oh, mm -hmm. you're you're just a human. I mean, like you're a human. <laughs> Sunny, what did you get? 71. 71. 71, you are a dragonborn. So that oh. means you are like a humanoid dragon looking character. Shit. I know, Shit. for real. Okay, roll that again. Roll the D100 again. Just the one? Yeah, yeah or no, the, the two dice okay. again. And then... 28. You got 28. So you are a cleric, a human cleric, Aaron. And Sunny, what are you? What did you Four, roll 46. there? 46. So you are a, a fighter. Well, that makes sense. Dragonborn fighter and a cleric. Okay, so let's roll up a personality trait. So now you can get, grab the fun die that is your D20. It's the one with the, the highest number is the 20. Okay. Roll that one. Let's find out what kind of characteristics you have, some personal traits. Um, 19. 19. Uh, okay, you're a bit of a know-it-all, apparently. So. So, so now you're starting to think, think about the character. Think you're a cleric, which is a, like a healer. It's like a, a magical healer. And Sunny, do you want to roll a d20? I got a one. You got a one. You're shy. You're a shy dragon. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. I know. There, there really is no role playing. And uh, let's, let's pick out, a, just do another d20 roll for me, for you guys both. Five. Four. You got a five. You enunciate over uh, overtly clearly, like you're very you. When you speak, you speak really quickly. True. You know. but, but shy about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And 
<laughs> Aaron, what did you roll? Uh, I, I rolled a 14. You rolled a 14. You apparently squint a lot. No. So, yeah, you're a know-it-all. Uh, Sarah's curating. making points like this. I think that's like the description of a curator is a human cleric know-it-all. <laughs> this is great. So sometimes role play is a dragon fighter. <laughs> and then the artists are dragons. I yeah. actually like this now. Okay. And um, so when you're playing D D, it's never you never talk about your stats, like how strong you are, how uh, you know, how much you can dodge things or whatever. You're always talking about stories. And so let's get into a little bit of story crafting here. Can you both roll a D6? So that's a standard six-sided die, the square one. Mm -hmm. And we're going to pick out some events that happened to you. So what did you roll on that, Aaron? A four. A four. So a four. OK, so roll a D12 uh, and a tragedy happened to you. So a D12. Kind of looks like a more faceted version of that D20. Okay. And so roll that up for me. Okay. Or did you say four? Yeah. A 10. A 10 on four. So weird stuff. You met a demigod or an arch devil, uh, and you live to tell the tale. So mm -hmm. there you go. You, you've seen some dark things, some, some nasty stuff. It, again, like a curator, you yep. kind of, you know, this is very on point. Uh, Sunny, do you want to roll a d6? Yep, four. A four, you got a four. Okay, roll a d12 on that one. Two. A two. So uh, you were petrified and remained a stone statue for some time until <laughs> someone freed you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe while you die. Okay. <laughs> we can't tell if you're frozen. So there we go. So those are some. Uh, do you guys want to roll some more characteristics, or should we move on? Well, I'm here. We see Laura. Uh, we see Laura sitting in the background and waiting for the chat. So uh, she's doing this rolling thing. I don't know if it means like okay, or give her give her some, give her some more. Okay, why don't you roll another uh, another uh, D six, both of you? I was talking about Laura. I want, I want to see what Laura gets. <laughs> What'd you get, Aaron? I got a two. You got a two? Okay, so uh, this is an adventure that you went on. Roll a D100, so that's those two dice again. So the ones that look like those okay. guys with the two zeros. Okay. Uh, 17. 17. You suffered a grievous injury. Although the wound, is, the wound has healed, it is still painful from time to time. Yeah. Yeah, so that's true. true. That's so true. Thanks, <laughs> Sunny. Roll a d6. D6. Two. A two. Okay. Uh, roll a d100. Eight. An eight. Okay. Oh, you nearly died. Uh, you'd had nasty scars on your body, and you're missing an ear. Oh, you're missing an ear uh, or a finger. So, um, yeah. You can decide which which limb you're missing. So you're a one eared. This is very good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, join us next week. We're actually going to turn this into a podcast, Aaron and Sunny, for your uh, dragonborn, uh, one eared dragonborn who uh, is shy, uh, and uh, your cleric, your human cleric, as they adventure and delve deep into the tomb of annihilation. Super in. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> oh, I think we're here. We're just uh, in time for another commercial break. One of our sponsors. Oh, yes. The following program is a paid advertisement for the Niagara Artist Center. This special TV membership package is not available in retail stores. People and objects shown have been lightly sprayed with canola oil for appearance. Do simple everyday tasks leave your poor hands feeling flustered? Hands are supposed to grab and carry with ease, but is gravity getting you down? Are your appendages making your life one big catastrophic mess after another? Do everyday tasks threaten your sense of human dignity? Do annoying wisps of hair fall into your eye when you're exhausted and wearing rubber gloves? If you find yourself lost with problems like these, then a Niagara Artist Center membership might be just what you need to turn your initial skepticism towards unfamiliar things into a dawning sense of exaggerated enthusiasm. Whether you are an artist, an arts-loving member of the public at large, or just an ordinary person who likes crafting makeshift doll coffins out of Belbatost and Denture adhesive, 
There are so many reasons to become a member of the Niagara Artist Center, or NAC, as we affectionately call it. Listen now to what these young members have to say about why they love NAC. Hi. Why do I love the NAC? Well, it's a really cool place to find stuff that's going on in downtown St. Catharines that you might not find somewhere else. And once you get involved there, you can pretty much use it at your own disposal, as in use their equipment or use their showroom to have your show. I like it. NAC helped create good training for students like myself to help me create a stronger future. Uh, I joined to the Nayara Art Center because I saw that they have a posted uh, uh, workshop about book binding. Now because of that I took my book down to Mexico and I got published with the presentation of the book that Tony helped me to do through the Niagara Art Center. That is cool! I like how everyone is not normal but we can all get along in this room. Knock, 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 knock! Knock, knock, knock! With a NAC membership you'll be sure not to miss splendid exhibits like Ready Player Two and many other extravaganzos of cultural experience lying somewhere between the overly academic and the purely entertaining. NAC memberships are guaranteed to last one full year and come in five easy to use sizes. Student, artist or art enthusiast, arts supporter, arts patron, and of course, champion. Sign up today. Order online at www.nac.org or visit one of our two convenient locations in beautiful downtown St. Catharines on the parking lot. We accept cash, debit, check, Visa, and MasterCard. Not sure if your membership has expired? Want to upgrade your membership? Call us at 905-641-0331 or email us at artists at nac.org and let us help you. So welcome back to Ready Player Two TV. Um, so this has been the, the incredible success of Ready Player Two uh, with all its touring shows and now our award-winning catalog that is coming out uh, next year. Uh, we are so excited. Uh, we teamed up with the amazing minds of Nintendo. And uh, over the past three months, we've been doing this virtually. We've been working with our programmers. We've been working. We got uh, Koji Kondo out of retirement to do some uh, work. Sunny and I put on motion capture suits and worked Fun. in our studios for all of that stuff. And we've created an immersive video game experience for I you all it. to experience. And uh, we've, we've fortunate we've had a bit of a playthrough and uh, got some screen caps and some video for our video game that's coming out. So actually, can we roll that right now, Johnny? Do it, Johnny. Well, thanks. That was great. I'm really excited for this video game. I think it's oh going to be gosh. phenomenal. Like it's coming to Switch, the new PS5, and the new Xbox S and S, and it's just really amazing. Um, but with that, I like to say this: this is it, folks. I like to thank you all for joining us here this evening. Thank you to all of our guests that came with us tonight. Uh, Laura Schneider, a.k.a. Schluter, who joins us from the farthest depths of Abbotsford. Um, Aaron Fay coming at us from Nelson. Uh, Johnny, uh, he's our producer and director. 
you're in Vancouver, I think. Uh, and uh, Brendan, you're in Vancouver, and here I am in Cab River. Thank you all for joining us on chat and with us this evening. Uh, but, you know, we got to talk about this catalog because it's really going to be great. Um, you really got to check it out when it's available. Uh, like we said earlier, you can go, go to the reach.ca and that's where you could sign up to get one. Um, and I'm really excited for you to get this cheesy, Hawkins cheesy colored goodness into your hands. Uh, such a great deal at $45.95 plus shipping and handling. Um, our designer, uh, Sebastian Obine, did a really wonderful job on this. It's worth more than $45. Um, but for you know, a handful of easy payments, you could have this book in your hands. No COD at all now order this now and johnny i swear if you cut me off i'm gonna be mad because people are going to be excited to get this book they're gonna have they're gonna get a whole bag of 